So, so I was saying, I think this topic is really an important conversation because I think it lends to a greater appreciation and opening of the question of who we are as people and what our national identity entails. And so I want to start by asking a couple of rhetorical questions, which I will attempt to answer. And the first one is, what is cultural memory? It's a great question. Uh, one definition of cultural memory might be it is a form of collective memory shared by a group of people. Cultural memory is often stored in objects such as museums or historical monuments. It could also include statues, symbols, public art, and other historical relics. Now, I want to suggest that cultural memory may be a subset of a larger concept called collective memory. And collective memory, thinking about um, John Tosh's book, The Pursuit of History, suggests that collective memory has to do with the storehouse of memories that we collectively have. It gives a sense of shared history, a sense of a shared common past. And generally, when we think of collective memory, we're thinking about books and texts, you know, the stuff that historians in academia generally publish and generate. But Cultural memory is sort of a smaller subset of the collective memory because cultural memory has more to do with <clears throat> public history outside of academia, where we're looking at artifacts, we're looking at ruins, we're looking at sculptures, monuments, etc., as a specific way of eliciting a kind of memory uh, and kind of creating, in many ways, a memory for us. And so, cultural memory is a subset of that collective memory and it's specifically focusing on what, what I said, which is the objects. Could be museums, could be monuments, could be sculptures, could be other kinds of relics. And I think that's an important conversation that we want to have as well. So I wanted to make that distinction as we move forward. Uh, another way of defining cultural or collective memory is to think about the act of recalling events that are related with objects, places, and encountered by people in a social framework or between groups that experience these events. So again, we're thinking about what I call public history, where we have persons, maybe tour guides or curators, who give a sense of purpose or meaning behind an object in a museum, or perhaps a sculpture or artifact that is in public display in a particular area, and how we create a, a meaning behind the object or behind the sculpture. And so that interface uh, between the object sculpture, the artifact in a museum, and the curator is an important space for interpreting meaning and context for what that actually says to the person viewing it. So that's an important dimension, I think, to this idea of collective memory. Um, I want to say also a final consideration on this concept or the term and defining it is that at first glance, memory seems something inert or stuck in the past. A memory of something, we usually think about memory related to the past, something that you recall, you remember, a remembrance of. But a closer look reveals that memory is dynamic. Memory is dynamic. And it actually connects the three temporal dimensions evoking, and that is the past, the present, and of course the future. Memory is dynamic and it connects those three temporal dimensions. The past, and here I'm giving a little further de definition, the past is what actually happened. You get that? History is what is said to have happened. And memory is the dynamic tissue or sinew that connects both the past, the present, and the future. I'm getting a little theoretical here, but it's for a reason. Because I find a lot of times we conflate the past and history. Okay. I'm going to try and give a, a concrete example, if I could, about how past history and memory are all interconnected in interesting ways. Okay, so everyone is familiar with um, the statue of Columbus in Columbus, 
man. So when we look at Columbus, uh, we see an individual who represents uh, a figure who's quite controversial, obviously, right? And um, when you think about it, the past is that moment when history is created. So we look at that moment, October 12th, 1492. And that is exactly when history was made in a sense, because you have this collision of cultures and you have Columbus you know, landing on San Salvador and this debate as to what island is actually Columbus's San Salvador. But for the moment, let's just imagine that that moment created a past event, a past event, October 12, 1492. We just commiserated it last Wednesday, okay? And in 1992, it was the quincentennial commiseration, or some people would have said celebration. And, and so that's remarkable for a past event. But that's not history. That's the past. Let me explain why. You see, historians have long debated the significance of that encounter, that collision of cultures. There was a time, I'm going to be honest, from probably the 15th century to the mid 20th century, Columbus was celebrated, particularly as a man representative of the age of discovery, right? I mean, he was bold enough and courageous to sail west beyond the event horizon, you know, risking life and limb to eventually land in the new world. And he was remarkable because he was the only one who actually wrote it down. So even if Leif Erikson uh, or Simon Van Sima and others have suggested Africans may have traversed the Atlantic, uh, Vikings earlier, Leif Erikson, it was really Columbus who tied the knot, who connected and bridged the two worlds, the old and the new world, by actually writing it down and recording October 12, 1492. So that's when the past began. But history also, what is said to have happened rather than what actually happened also began to germinate. Why? Because historians started to make meaning out of the past, interpreting the significance of that past singular event. So as I said, most historians valorized um, Columbus as this great man, the age of discovery, for a long time. That, that, that narrative, that paradigm of thinking about Columbus probably lasted into the mid 20th century. There was a other narrative that didn't quite compete, but was sort of like, um, a sidebar kind of conversation was this idea that even if he wasn't a great man or a man of the age of discovery, he was a victim of Spanish colonial intrigue, meaning that you would have known Columbus got thrown into Pauper's prison at the end of his life, died in debt in, in a Spanish um, prison. And, and the reason is he didn't quite match up to what the Spanish uh, king and queen expected from him, didn't bring in enough gold, didn't find enough land. He never seemed to get the kind of quota that they expected. That's because they were driven by greed and the desire for glory and gold, the three Gs. And so he didn't measure up to the Spanish expectations. So you have two competing narratives, but one I would say was more compelling than the other. The idea of Columbus uh, as a victor, followed with the idea of him being possibly a victim. So those two Vs, victor, and victim were the two sort of dominating narratives into the 20th century. And guess what happened in the 20th century? A new narrative emerged that sees Columbus as a villain. So you have victor, victim, and now we have villain. Why does the villain narrative of Columbus dominate? I think it has a lot to do with our collective memory and how we construct the past even now. So in the age of decolonization, 1950s, you have a wave of decolonization spreading across Africa and the Caribbean and Southeast Asia to an extent. And with that wave comes this view that, you know, colonialism has led to the underdevelopment of the region. Colonialism has had a negative impact on our psychology, on how we see ourselves. Colonialism created a lot of social ills an abysmal educational system, an underdeveloped and underfunded educational system, a healthcare system that is broken, and of course, a social welfare system that never got any attention at all. 
So all of the problems of colonialism started to be manifested in a way that led people to drive for independence, to throw the shackles of colonialism off. Well, in that whole drive for independence, people started to think of Columbus as sort of like the face of colonialism, right? And in that way, and in that vein, he was seen in a very negative light. So he becomes a villain. He becomes the face of colonialism. And so what I'm trying to show in that very short um, conversation about Columbus as an example, is to show you how the past is distinct from history and how they're intersecting with the idea of memory. So let me explain just a little bit more. The past was the date when he arrived. That can't change. You can't take a time machine. Well, if you could, I guess you could. But it really, unless you can take a time machine to go back to 1492, we can't erase the past. It happened. What is said to have happened changes all the time. That's history. So historians, like I've shown you just now, have debated this, the significance of Columbus. And we've seen a, a shifting from victor and to a degree victim to a, a concerted effort to see him now as a villain. That's historiography. That's the debates and conversations that historians often have about the past. So what I'm trying to say is what is said to have happened always and often changes. All right? As new research comes out, as new information arises, as new methodologies develop, history will change. The past can't change, but history always changes. And where does memory play into all of that? See, I believe that memory is part of our collective consciousness and our personal memories, our recollections of the past also influence how we think about history and the past. So for example, me growing up, uh, I was born in 1971, I confess. I was born into an independent Bahamas. I was born into an environment in which we were already rethinking the narrative of Columbus. All right. And so what I learned from my experiences as a young boy in the post-independence Bahamas growing up would be different from someone who had lived 30 or 40 years before me. And is also remarkably different from this new generation Z who thinks differently than I do because they're so, so removed from independence, they're not so aware of the struggles that our, our um, founding fathers and mothers went through to throw those shackles of colonialism off. So where we are placed in our own personal memories shape how we think collectively. And that is why we see this idea of cultural memory as sort of a dynamic and fluid sort of process that intersects with both the past, the present, and the future. And that leads me to the next question. What does our public monuments and relics say about our collective cultural memory? I want us to focus on, on Parliament Square. Now, Parliament Square is that square with the public buildings that sort of engulf it or encompass it. So we have our legislative building or, or the lower house. And in the middle, you have the upper house, otherwise known as the Senate. And then we have a third building, government building on the side there. And that is the Parliament Square. Now facing Parliament Square is another square called Rawson Square. A lot of people think Rawson Square and Parliament Square are, are the same. They are different in a, a number of important ways. And the most important way is the statues that we find in both squares. So in Parliament Square, you have this mammoth, mammoth square, mammoth statue of Queen Victoria. It's very tall, very big, right? And at the time, Queen Victoria was the longest ruling monarch in Great Britain's history. Of course, she's been surpassed by the recently deceased Queen Elizabeth. Across from that mammoth statue of Queen Victoria is a very diminutive statue of Sir Milo Butler, the first Bahamian Governor General. It's disturbing and a startling contrast if you think about it, because here's a man that in life was very large. He was not a small man. Um, when, for example, in April of 1965, two weeks before Black Tuesday, when the Mason hourglass were thrown out of the House of Assembly, that was April 27th, 1965, him and A.D. Hanna were actually carried out of the House of Assembly because they had gone beyond the time that was allotted for them to speak. And, you know, as rebellious men, they continued to speak in, in defiance of, of the speaker, Bobby Simonet. So Bobby Simonet ordered them out. Now, to get Milo Butler out of the House of Assembly required four constables to carry him. I know one for each 
limb, body, you know, arm, leg, whatever. Because he was such a big man. Adi Han, of course, jokingly, um, when he only required one man to carry him out, said, I expect the same treatment as my apartment butler. Please give me three more men. <laughs> You know, typical of uh, A.D. Hanna, right? So, and the point I'm making though is, Milo Butler was a man who was powerful in every way. I mean, he spoke out against racial oppression. Uh, he was a great orator. Um, many of the great speeches that were made were made either in parliament or a lot of times outside of parliament at Southern Recreational Grounds or even in Parliament Square. And yet we've reduced him to pint size to a bust facing this mammoth statue of Queen Victoria. In a, in a political space, let's be honest, this is Bay Street, in a political space that is significant to our country. I mean, this is where our legislator has met for hundreds of years. We have had a representative government since 1729 and they originally met in John Colbert's house. They didn't meet where it is now because the public buildings weren't built until the loyalists arrived. But that point, nevertheless, should be, should be um, clear that we have had this sense of political representative government for a long time. And Parliamentary Square and Rawson Square are significant spaces. And what we've done with these spaces is created a large statue of a queen which represents our colonial past in opposition to a small diminutive statue of a man that represents a freedom fighter and a person that represents one of our national heroes, but in a very diminutive state. And so we wonder why is it that we have done this and what is the meaning that we can have about these spaces? And I wanna, if I could again theorize because it's significant what Stuart Hall and, and to a degree Benedict Anderson has said, because Benedict Anderson has said that nationalism is a social construct and that we create meanings and want to remind us of who we are and what kind of nation we represent by the symbols and statues that we create. And the fact that most of the statues that we have that are in large um, public spaces that are also political spaces tend to be colonial um, objects says something about us. I mean, even Columbus, the statue is in front of government house, another relic of colonialism and its location in front of that house, again, sends a very clear uh, to me message about where we're at as a country. And so symbolic placement is important. The symbolic placement of these two statues on opposite ends of parliamentary square to me speaks to the ways in which museums and sculptures may constitute manifestations of identity or be sites for contestation of identities. And so cultural theorist uh, Stuart Hall has argued that what the nation means is an ongoing project under constant reconstruction. And that we come to know its meaning partly through the objects and artifacts which have been made to stand for and civilize its essential values. So it seems like what we've done is we've created or we've allowed for 50 years coming up next year, a colonial representation to linger into our post-independence reality, all right? Both with the statue of Columbus and also with Queen Victoria located where they are in politically charged spaces, as I said, all right? And so it, it, it begs the question, what is our identity when we hold on to, linger on to these colonial vestiges, these statues? And I would draw your attention to the fact that we also have another statue of Woods Rogers located uh, in front of the, the colonial, used to be the colonial Hilton, now we'll just call it the colonial hotel. It's currently not owned by the, the hotel franchise yet. But the point is the statue is still there. Uh, we do have statues of, of Bahamian heroes in other places, just so you know. Uh, I've already mentioned um, Sir Milo and I've mentioned um, uh, other statues uh, of British origin, but I, I want to mention Sir Milo Butler is the only one. We have a statue of Lyndon Pinley by the airport. Everyone know where the statue of Lyndon Pinley is located? And this is, this is troublesome as well for a number of reasons. Th that statue is located 
outside of the international terminal, right on the bend as you exit the airport. Um, the problem is, in my opinion, it's it's not prominently placed. And so, injuries. yes, yeah. So even though the airport is LPIA named after him, uh, the statue is it's almost hidden. There's there's some trees and shrubbery around there, and, and apparently, you know, we know we know Lyndon Pinnon was not a tall man. All right, you know, he was sort of short in stature, but you you could have elevated him and put him on like a pedestal in a, in a location where he wasn't so hidden. Um, and so, you know, that's just a critique that, again, you have the diminutive Sir Milo in Rawson Square, and then you have a short piddling uh, at the airport, not in a prominent location. What else do we have? There is a statue of a woman and her child by Rawson Square. It's actually in the back towards where the new port is being constructed. And again, it's a powerful statue. You have this um, black woman cradling a, a child. And, and that's one of the few statues we have of a female. But why is she located in the back area of, of a promenade of a place where people can hardly even see her? And very, very few people know about this statue. Why is she not placed somewhere else where, again, you could get prominence to her? Yeah. I know you raised a really important point because more people even see the pictures mm -hmm. of the athletes when they exit or yeah. enter, you know, to yeah. be cleared from customs. And so you could have even put him there where the statue of the police officer is. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Which is huge. Yeah. I mean, you can't miss that even so, if you were so, 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 um, and, and again, I, I want to tease this out just a little bit more. Um, I, I've had the pleasure of traveling a little bit to other countries. So I've been to Cuba, and if you go to Cuba, you know they have two, three-story high statues of like Jose Marti, you know, freedom fighter from their wars of independence with Spain, turn of the 20th century. Uh, certainly they have a statue of Che Guerrero, Argentinian doctor who was part of their struggle, uh, the revolution in 59. And certainly Fidel and Raul and the Castro brothers are prominent as well in very important public spaces, squares and promenades, you see these statues manifested and they're not just life size. I mean, they're huge mm -hmm. mammoth statues. And not to pick on a socialist country to the South. Uh, I've also traveled to Canada and uh, I've been to um, Niagara on the Lake, Niagara Falls area. And I went to Brock University for my bachelor's degree. And at Brock University, it's named after a, a general of the War of 1812. The War of 1812 was a war Canada claims they won. The War of 1812 is also the war the Americans claim they won. So I, I read a, a scholar's book, I think it was one of my history professors at Brock. He wrote a book called The War That Both Sides Won. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so what, what, what happened in the War of 1812? Some people think it was the second American Revolution. The Americans tried to invade what was British territory. Remember, Canada remained British. Um, up until 1867. But anyways, the point is that the British forces repelled the American invaders. So they never actually technically took over the territory that we now call Canada, the province of Ontario. So the Canadians would claim victory. Well, guess how they celebrate Sir Isaac Brock? They have a 60 foot statue of him at Queensland Heights, all right, which is in the Niagara on the Lake area. Isaac Brock famously died during one of the battles in the War of 1812. Apparently, as he was dying, he whispered some words to his horse, something like Sergate in Latin speaking. To, who would speak to their horse, number one? And who would speak Latin to their horse as they're dying? But nevertheless, besides him saying Sergate, which apparently in Latin means, you know, press on, uh, that was his last dying words. Well, he celebrated in Canada as this great hero of the War of 1812 with a 60-foot statue of himself. A university is named after him, Brock, where I got my bachelor's degree. So I'm thinking between Canada and Cuba and all these other countries in between, we don't even have to talk about the United States. The United States has all kinds of monuments, right? From the Lincoln Memorial to Mount Rushmore and everywhere in between, celebrating their heroes and heroines. So I wonder about us. I wonder about us. Um, now we have, we do have museums as well. 
right? So just to think about museums a little bit, let's move away from monuments. We have in the downtown Nassau area, uh, about three or four private museums. We have the Pirate Museum, um, interesting. Great Cliff has a series of museums on both sides of the street on West Hill Street. There's also um, the, the uh, Bahamas Historical Society on Elizabeth Street, which is also a museum. And then you have, you know, our, our government museums as well. So of course I would know about these, but let's just make sure we understand what we're talking about. We have, of course, Pompeii Museum, and we have Balcony House, uh, managed by AMC. Then you have NAGB, which is the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas. All right, and so these are our museums, but what we don't have yet, what we don't have yet is a National Museum of the Bahamas, okay? A repository for all things Bahamian. And so that is one thing that concerns me. Again, if you go to uh, the United States, they have the mall area and they have literally museums on both sides uh, that are accessible to the public and are wonderful, wonderful museums. They're all part of their collective national museum area. What do we have? What do we have in the Bahamas? I, I forgot to mention in Grand Bahama, there's a newly open maritime museum uh, in the uh, Lucaya port area, which is a fantastic museum. We also operate a museum in Long Island, okay? So we have examples of museums on a smaller scale, but we do not have a national museum to speak of. Right, right. Like the presidential, but I mean, it's yes. like that called the prime minister a lot. Yes. Prime minister's library. Yes. Like no. We're missing a lot of things. We're, we're missing. We're missing things. That's right. And I'll leave you with my last final, final comment on things that are missing. So I've been talking about statues and I've talked a little bit about museums and I've talked about memory, uh, cultural memory and, and collective memory. One of the things that helps a country find out who they are and to preserve, I guess, a sense of identity, national identity and an important understanding of collective consciousness, who we are as people is a national park. And we do not have a national heroes park yet. Now I'll tell you what the story, there is a story, there is a story behind it. So um, in 2017, I think this was in January or February, 2017, there was a ceremony in the Botanical Gardens area. And the then prime minister, Perry Christie, announced the establishment of a national heroes park in the environs of Botanical Gardens, right behind Fort Charlotte. And it was heralded as a, as a wonderful moment. The problem was May 10th, 2017 happened. What happened on May 10th, 2017? PLP lost the general election. And unfortunately, what happens a lot of times in our country is when an election happens, everyone gets swept out. And their ideas. And their ideas, good, bad, or ugly. And the new dispensation, the new regime comes in and starts from scratch. So for whatever reason, that National Heroes Park didn't happen, didn't happen. Here we are now in 2022, and we've had another general election, but nothing has happened to that area that was supposed to be the National Heroes Park. So I, um, I had myself have to try um, from about four or five years ago, I submitted a proposal for a National Heroes Park. I can share this confidently. Um, I was inspired when I went to Jamaica. I stayed at the Pegasus. I don't know if anyone knows the Pegasus, but it's right across the street from Jamaica's National Heroes Park. This is another point, just to make a note of this, that Jamaica has a National Heroes Park. And I was inspired. They have like quadrants where they have areas separated for different things. And so I have thoughtfully considered and put in a proposal uh, for a similar design feature. Uh, we would have quadrants for each area of our archipelago so that if it be, ever becomes a National Heroes Park, it would not be a NASA centric initiative. It would encompass the entire Bahamas. And the idea is that you would have a fifth quadrant what we would call the pavilion area. We might have a, a band shell, an area for 
performing arts, music, and, and also, of course, a restaurant and kiosk for food. Um, so I don't know what is going to happen, but I hope that my ideas, and I have, we have a committee that have been working on this. Um, I don't work alone. I work with other people. But my hope and dream is that a government of the Bahamas will embrace the idea of establishing a national bureau's party will actually move from idea to execution to have it in place. Because I honestly believe, in the words of Marcus Josiah Garvey, people without knowledge of their past, it's like a tree by use. If we don't have these demonic reminders through statue, through park, through museum, who we are as a people, we're going to be lost. And we're going to be a rudderless ship. We're going to have no destination. Mind. So we need these things to be established to help us with our own collective sense of self, understanding of the points of culture, those objects and artifacts and things that have to remind us who we are. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions that you might have. Hi, Chris. Wonderful presentation, very informative. Thank you. Thank you very much. That sounds like Dr. Walker. That's me. <laughs> um, Thank you, you know, you know, you know what I think? I think going forward, uh, the, the national institutions together perhaps need to combine because on the one hand, they, we even have legislation for national information, national library and information services. Then there, we, we were wanting a national museum. We have the National Art Gallery, which I think is there, but but could be better. I'm wondering if perhaps we all need to come together instead of trying to fight an individual battle. I would because, love to see, yeah, yeah, it, it, it is pathetic. That. Yeah, it, it is pathetic what's happening with our libraries and and look at the public image, downtown NASA Public Library. I mean, that's almost an embarrassment in terms of the physical structure, but it has such a strong and interesting historical context. And, and nobody seemed to be fighting these battles. I, I think we all need to come together and do something. I totally, totally, totally agree with you, Dr. Walker. The only suggestion I would make to, to make that happen, and I think I, I'm kind of in concurrence with what you're saying, is um, we need to have like a heritage act that would be created by legislation to bring everything under one umbrella. So all of these different government organizations and agencies from NAGB to the archives, to uh, AMMC could be all under one administrative umbrella, working towards a common goal with a national museum, national library, and even a national park. Do you remember the, the um, Jumbe village concept? Yes, it was Ed Moxie's idea. That's yes. right. Um, was that the intent for uh, a national heroes or, or a national park? Well, he was trying to create uh, Jumbe Village, as you know, which is an area where we call Coconut Grove or, you know, the area stretching from Blue Hill all the way down to East Street. Um, and, and I guess north to, to Wolf Road and, and, and south to probably um, Robinson Road. And, and um, you know, they have a clinic there. Uh, I forget the actual name of the street. But uh, that area ha has a library as well and that connected to the clinic. Um, and and um, the, the actual... Jumbe Village was supposed to be a cultural center where they had music and performing arts uh, uh, weekly. And, you know, they had a structured program along with um, um, some, some um, they had like, I think they even had like Lucayan villages. They had mm -hmm. everything set up in a way to sort of create like a, a heritage site. Uh, but uh, sadly, and I, I've traced the history of it, it, it did not get the kind of financial support that it needed from the administration at the time. Uh, this is in the early 70s and eventually things fell apart quote you know uh, chevy's book and and unfortunately what was left and what has remained is basically just the the clinic and the libraries the shell of the former jumbe village you do know a park is there now right pardon me you do know that a park is on that site the new park yes yes yeah. i'm aware of that so so next it's on the of course driving let's say we're driving on blue hill road 
uh, going north, that park that you're referring to is on the left by the uh, NIH yes. supporters. Yeah. It's a basketball court. And then I think they have in the back play, a play area. And, and it's a beautiful park. I would say it, it rivals the, the park that has been installed by Southern Recreational Grounds by St. Agnes. If you get a chance to tour that park as well, those are the two parks in recent times that are commendable. But as commendable as those two parks are, we still do not have a National Heroes Park. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I take your words. Thank you, Dr. Walker. All right, let's work on it. Let's get it done. Yes, absolutely. There's a question in the chat from Virginia. Okay. And so she is asking, um, what is the origin of the statues of musical giants um, at UB? Oh. And were they slated for the National Heroes Park? Right. Thank you, Virginia. Um, now, I don't know exactly the origin. Let me describe where they're located. I actually had them in my notes somehow I managed to miss that point. Um, so if you go to A Block here at UB, there's uh, a, a number of statues. I think you have Peanut Taylor. Uh, I want to say King Eric yeah. Gibson. And, Ronnie Butler. Pardon me? Butler, Ronnie Ronnie. Butler. Right. And it's right by the gazebo by A Block. So I understand they were privately donated. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't know if I'm certain as to who the donor was. I think I know it is, but I don't want to, for accuracy's sake, I'll just leave it. Right. So they were donated, and the, the, I'm not saying that that was a bad thing. It's great that we have those statues here, but what I'm seeing is this trend where a lot of our statues of prominent persons tend to be obfuscated either by location or by selective choice as to where they get placed yeah and so again they're they're in a good prominent place for ub students but for the general public they're not as accessible True that. right so much like you know and again we've already talked about the the, the statue of pinling and we've talked about the uh the statue of milo butler problematic for different reasons but overall the impression we're getting is that you know they're not displayed prominently in a public space Question. Uh, we know there's been constant talk about Christopher Columbus. That being a part of, whether we like it or not, that's still a part of our history. Do we get rid of that? And would it be the real reason for us to be getting rid of it? Because it has nothing to do with us. But obviously, it had some part to play in our history. I don't know who was totally in line of putting that particular statue where it's at. But it's there. So, you know, you just have so much talk. And it's, it's still history for the Bahamas. So, I'm going to say, if you listen to my lecture, yeah. I would say that that's okay. That's okay. I would say it's part of our past. Mm -hmm. Past can't change. It's what actually happened. Okay. History is what is said to have happened, and history changes all the time. I'll tell you the history now and how it has changed. So, that statue was erected around 1831, 1832. It is alleged that free blacks who supported and loved, and I'm saying alleged, underscore that series is a big debate about this, that uh, James Carmichael Smith, who was allegedly sympathetic with free blacks, allegedly an abolitionist, um, was therefore given a gift by free blacks. The gift that was given to him was the statue of Columbus. Okay, he was governor in this period. However, he wanted the statue initially to be where Free Victorians in oh, parliamentary yeah. square. However, because he was allegedly sympathetic with free blacks and allegedly an abolitionist, the white parliamentarians who dominated the House of Assembly did not like that idea at all. So that is how instead of it being in parliamentary square, it was placed at government I house. Mean, That's the story behind the statue. Now, again, understand this. In the 1830s, there's already a shift in, in, in interpretation and understanding of Columbus, all right? He's not seen as the villain that he was by the mid 20th century as decolonization uh, spread across Africa and the Caribbean, but he's still now seen as a complicated figure by the 1830s, hence the, the trepidation as to where we place him in Parliament Square or on the Hill, all right? So, but that's how he ultimately ended up on the Hill in front of government house itself, a representative figure or a representation, I should say, of colonialism. Now, fast forward to 2022, we're in a post-colonial environment in the Bahamas, post-independence, where um, 
no longer valorizing and lauding Columbus and his accomplishments. We see him as a highly problematic figure. And so there's a popular wave across the Bahamas right now to have him removed. All right, but there are questions about that removal because where, for one, if you remove him, the statue, where do you put him? All right, and then if you remove him, well, what do you replace him with? Yeah. All right, and then some people are saying, well, you know, for like it better or worse, you know, he landed here first, so you know, in a way, he brings attention to the Bahamas. All right, so there are a lot of different conversations and different opinions about. Mm -hmm the statue, as well as the man behind the statue. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm arguing though is rather than focusing so much on a singular statue, my view is we need to create rather than just criticize, right? And so what we need to do is be more proactive in creating monuments, statues, relics, symbols that best identify who we are as a people, all right? So I'm trying to spin this into a positive, consideration for our National Heroes Park, that we could do better about imagining and creating what we think best represents us as a people today. What are we doing for ourselves? What are we doing for ourselves? All right, and I would argue in that vein, Columbus doesn't represent us very well. And he is bringing a group of cultures that don't feel as though they have, they share any identity with what he stood for. Um, there was a big debate about it. I think yeah, I think in, in, the, in the spring of 2020, as we rounded into COVID, mm -hmm. and you would have had um, these tragic um, lynchings. I'm going to use a very strong term here. George Floyd was lynched. Mm -hmm. All right, you had Breonna Taylor's death. You had um, Ahmaud Aubrey's shooting by vigilantes in an upscale neighborhood in Georgia, right? Uh, you had other persons before that, like my friend, um, Bothell Jean in Houston, Texas, where a white off-duty police officer walked into the wrong apartment. She's sitting there eating his ice cream and she just shoots him in his apartment. In his apartment. His apartment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I met the family and I've been wearing this ever since. Uh, just to remind myself of what is happening since 1619 in the United States. Um, and so that was a wave in 2020 that led to this Black Lives Matters movement. And actually, the movement goes before that. Uh, you know, it's the young man in, in, in Florida, Martin, Ravon Martin. And we've had this for a long time in the US. So it stems back to 1619. Um, what did we think about um, what I consider domestic terrorism in the US? And, and so um, all of that is to say, um, that you had statues in the South, these Confederate statues being torn down and that whole momentum and movement in the US. And so it is, I think in a way, influenced us to a degree uh, as to how we consider what we should be doing with our statues, um, what we should be doing to replace what we already have. I try to look at it from a constructive point of view again. So my, my focus is on creating rather than destroying looking at how we could create a national heroes park that would do um, a great service to us as people. So that's what I would like to see. I work in those of us who, I think you're preaching to the choir, people who uh, would agree with what's going on. What can we do? Um, you know, as librarians, people interested in this, you know, I see the relevance of this work. Because it seems as though successive governments, governments will talk about it, and it just seems like it's lip service, but no one ever puts their money where their mouth is. I've heard of, of National Library talk from before I even yeah. became a librarian, right. and, and it doesn't seem as though we're serious about it. We even talk about a national plan, mm. and you know, the Hamans wrote the National Plan of Singapore, a country that's been developing, um, you know, tremendously yeah. in, in, in some degree. So why is it that we're not serious? about developing ourselves. We, we contribute to other people's cultures and developments, but we're not, seem, we're not seemingly doing it for ourselves. I think, you know, I, I will say there's been some, some su success stories that we need to herald. I'll give an example, and it may be a inspiration for us in your question. So uh, 
from 1992, uh, Father Sebastian Campbell at the time and others started to agitate for us to change Discovery Day to National Heroes Day. It took almost 20 years. The holiday Discovery Day was not changed until 2013. What he did, it wasn't him alone, it was a group of them, consistently and persistently wrote to politicians, staged demonstrations, you know, drawing attention, doing whatever they could, going on radio shows, consistently and repeatedly doing what they needed to do. The, the movement gained traction, momentum, more people joined, and eventually became so, so big that the government could deny what they were asking for. So, so that is an example of a success. We now have a National Heroes Day celebrated last Monday, a week ago today. So, what is there to be learned from that? We have to be patient, we have to be persistent, and we must be using the literature to be possible. We have to continue to ask for the changes that people demand and not give up the first time the door is closed or the first time we get discouraged because the people who have the power are saying that's not important. So I think we must continue to work on these things. <laughs> Yeah. Bill on yes. Yes. It's become now a tourist attraction. Yeah. For them. So we have the same attraction in Taiwan. We have them on paper, but we don't have anything like yeah. like you say in a museum. Yeah, I, I, and I and I I am uh, I've been to Cuba, so that's how come I can appreciate what you just said. Like mm -hmm. I said, they have these very very clear um, monuments to their their revolutionaries, mm -hmm. to their uh, early freedom fighters. Very, very um, powerful what they've done in Cuba. Um, and our, our other contemporaries, I mentioned Jamaica has their National Heroes Party. They have very clear heroes, uh, Nanny uh, Greer. Um, they have, uh, of course, Sam Sharp. Um, they have a lot of persons represented as freedom Marley fighters. Has What's that? Bob Marley. Bob Marley as well, yeah. I'll tell you, we, we have, I, I, meant, I forgot to mention the statue. It's in the family island. Stevenson, if anyone's been to Stevenson, the jailhouse there, uh, there is a statue up there in front of it. But, but, but you know, something though, and, and, and I think sometimes I can have a discussion about this as to why we want to be to be as interested. And it's because culturally, some people struggle with the identity of what they are, with a behavior. And I, I know that Canada has been very intentional. Yeah. about in their education system about hiring mm -hmm. teachers that are humane so that they could keep and preserve their cultural identity. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, I mean, I know that we're small, but sometimes, we, you know, money is the reason why many things can't be done, but maybe, you know, maybe there's the issue of us needing to be more intentional to preserve yeah. our cultural identity. And that's what we need, you know, if, if you fail to find the plan, you fail. So we need to have a plan in place, a concerted plan. And I agree with what Dr. Walker was saying earlier. It has to be a plan that encompasses all of the different agencies of heritage, history, and preservation, including library officials, including archivists, including historians, archaeologists, all of the people that are in that kind of business. Sorry, that's my. <laughs> I think we're going to end there unless there's another comment. How do you um, preserve some of your junk? I mean, you see things over time. Like, it's so much invested in the costumes. We have no museum to even house them for a certain period that tourists could just come and visit and take care of. Educulture, that's Arlene Nash Ferguson. They have a small, it's a yeah. small museum up on, on West Street. Yes, we but, but you know, we could do more. We should have, again, if we have a national museum, we have a section dedicated to junk canoe and culture. <clears throat> uh, and I think the new, the, the new Welcome Center at the port would likely have something. But again, if we had that national museum, that could be. Something. And I will be on that. Um, so, Mr. Collins. Building. Ralph Collins, yes. Across the road, there was a school next to the Nassau Gallery where I attended. Yeah. Mr. Collins' building is history. So, how come that hasn't been preserved as a place where you can visit, see, and put different things in there? Yeah, 
Yeah, well, again, um, has to do with vision, and of course, financial investment as well. Thank you very much, thank everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm going to try to rest that class. We have a long way to go. <laughs>